sorry, in Scientific, Scientific American this month by um, Renata Lowell and some others, uh, they claim to have derived from first principles the um, dimensionality of our space, three plus one or four um, dimensions. Um, questionable again, but I, again, I bring these forward just to say, here's an interesting direction and this kind of thing um, is what we ought to be looking at. Uh, Garrett Lisi and the uh, E8 uh, Lie algebra uh, showed up as a possible candidate for a, um, a theory of everything last year and um, Stephen Wolfram's new kind of science which is, tries to explain everything in terms of cellular automata, again a very abstract notion at the base of it all. Here's um, the E8 theory, uh, 248 dimensional uh, Lie algebra. If you uh, decompose this into various parts, subalgebras, uh, Lisi would say that you uh, get a very good correspondence to gravity, the forces, particles, and so on. Um, some people who know a lot more group theory and mathematical physics than I do have said this really doesn't map well and it's not the answer, but uh, it's a good try. <clears throat> so let's go to the other end of the spectrum, the, the simplest possible thing. What's the simplest possible thing we could imagine in the abstract? Where, what's the starting place for everything that we must all share? And the answer, I think, is nothing, the void. And I don't mean the vacuum, the empty set, any of that kind of stuff. I mean nothing. Suppose we take nothing, we take the smallest step we can away from nothing. What would that be? Something. It doesn't have a name. It's not nothing. Okay, that's the first distinction. This is from G. Spencer Brown's Laws of Form. Two distinctions can be made in two different ways. Cardinality and bosons flow from the first. Ordinality and fermions from the second. So I think we're early on to something here. Um, some friends in Great Britain took um, this uh, idea, which they developed separately, by the way, not from Spencer Brown, and uh, tried to make a hierarchy of uh, groups by instantiating the number of different things you could distinguish at each level, 2, 3, 7, and 127. The total number of symbols, then, is um, 2, 3, 10, 137, and really big. Now, this caught their attention because 137 is very close to the reciprocal of the fine structure constant, and 310, 137, and really big are something like uh, the ratios of the strengths of the four forces. So this group has been looking to this quite a bit further than I can tell you about here and now. I don't know, again, I don't know whether this is going anywhere or not, but it certainly is interesting. Um, stepping to relativity, everybody knows that Lorentz transformation, the Lorentz factor is very uh, critical and connected to lots of things in physics, as you can see from this diagram in uh, Lucas and Hodgson's uh, book. And they go in, the, in the, into this book and derive Lorentz factors from uh, a wide variety of different viewpoints. So there's something very important about the Lorentz factor. But I'd like to see it described uh, and derived discreetly. So here I have an object and a very, very simple notion of motion. That is to say, if it moves one, uh, if it moves to the right, I count plus one. If it moves to the left, I count minus one. That's the um, simplest possible definition of motion I can think of. <clears throat> there's no rulers here, there's no clocks. When it moves, I tick my clock. If it moves in either direction, I tick my clock. And I keep track of, by counting, these dimensionless things, how far it's moved. Here's the number that it moved plus, minus the number it moved minus, that's kind of a distance. The number it moved plus, plus the number of times it moved in the other direction. And that's sort of a time. But we have no independent clocks whatsoever. So we turn that into a probability using uh, the sum of these uh, counts and f uh, for simplicity in the algebra. And we can note right away there's a maximum velocity, which is one one step per tick. If all the movement is in one direction, that's plus c. If it's all to the left, it's minus c. <clears throat> now let's take two such things and try to add the two velocities together. This is like firing a gun from the front of a rocket ship, let's say. So we're going to watch just the second object, which is moving in a similar way but relative to the first object, so that these things add up. So I add them up. Here's the first velocity, here's the second velocity. And look, look at these ter two terms right here. When number one goes in to the left and number two goes to the right, we don't see anything because they canceled each other out. When number two goes to the right 
and number one goes to the left, those are canceling, and we don't tick our clock either. No, no time passes. So we do the mathematics on that, just a, a little simple algebra gives you this answer. And sure enough, 1 plus v1, v1, v2 is in the denominator. So uh, all steps are still size 1. C is equal to 1. And when you add the velocities together, you get exactly the factor that special relativity would tell you. Can we derive all of special relativity from this idea? I don't know. I haven't done it yet. Stay tuned. But um, the idea is that we started it with something extremely simple before the usual notions of space and time. And we got to something very quickly that um, gives us uh, special relativ relativistic additive velocities. Summa summarizing, um, the constants seem arbitrary, but they might be purely mathematical, and there might be a lot to be learned about them from studying them as abstract mathematical um, objects and deductions. Uh, I'm advocating construction rather than, or in addition to, the usual reductionist approach combinatorics and so forth seem to be very important. Um, suggesting the idea of di distinction or difference as prior to object and maybe the ultimate origins. And um, the idea of discrete motion from pre-space and time and relativistic velocity addition. May I ask you a question? How many have ever heard of this discrete derivation of velocity addition before? Nobody? OK. Thanks. Uh, it was due to. Um, uh, Irving Stein and uh, Tom Etter, as I may have said, and um, uh, we're exploring that a lot further. Um, we're always seeking funding to continue this research, so if anybody's interested, please let me know. Thank you. Minutes for questions, and it looks like uh, Dave Leiter got his hand up first. Uh, Richard, this, this is more a, uh, an observation than a question. Uh, one of the first books that I read uh, entering into this whole realm, and I think I remember it correctly, was called Cosmic Consciousness by Maurice Burke. And what he predicted was that humanity was gr gradually becoming more and more and more intelligent. And uh, I'm almost seeing that happen uh, between the speakers and, and the audience. But we're kind of gathered for that, that purpose and because of that growing ability. It's a great sentiment. Thanks. Uh, okay, I sort of thought the speaker might have something to say in response. Any other questions? Uh, I did. I'd like to know what the implications are of the so-called cosmic axis of evil on your model. This idea that the universe has, a, it's not distributed evenly. You mentioned it briefly at the beginning of your talk, the background radiation. Yeah, the background radiation seems to have some kind of a pattern in it, and there's... Uh, an area where there's, where it's kind of sparse. I have no idea. It seems to me no more interesting than why are, why is that galaxy over here rather than over there? Um, but there's got to be a ton of information provided some from someplace. So where did that come from is a very good question. But on the other hand, <clears throat> if I gave you a huge number, let's see, a huge integer that was, oh, I don't know, 10 to the 100th digits long or something like that, uh, could I ask you to tell me how much information is in that integer? In other words, how much would it take in information terms to distinguish that integer from all other integers of the same size? Well, it might take a while to figure out whether or not that was a highly composite number I gave you or a, a prime or, or what. And the amount of information contained in a very complex thing is not always clear. That's my point. So if you think in terms of really, really, really huge numbers, it might be that there's less complexity required to specify this universe than we would first think. I don't know. Maybe there's a lot more patterns that we have not discerned yet, both um, mathematically and physically. I'm going to get in trouble for glossing. Um, 
the uh, 